Ahoy there! It only feels like yesterday a Windows XP support ended, when in reality it was about six years ago. I remember back in high school that there were a lot of computers that were running XP, which was basically all of them. And they would only recently end up getting upgraded to Windows 7 by the time I started. But for a long time, Windows XP was on all of the computers in my school come 2007, when I was in 3rd and 4th grade. I hold a lot of nostalgic value for XP. It was the operating system I used in school all the way up to freshman year of high school. And it was also the operating system that I was first introduced to in the Wild West of 2000's internet, and the malware I unknowingly installed on it. I was a kid back then, can you blame me? I just can't let go of XP, it's just so good. Fortunately, in recent years, I've added PCs and retro hardware into my list of hobbies and interests. LGR played a huge part in that, sending me further down the rabbit hole of PC games and odd, forgotten, and obsolete hardware. After watching his XP build multiple times and recently buying a Doom 3 at my local resale store, I decided to give myself a summer project of sorts. Which brings us to today's video, building a Windows XP Project PC. Although I'm more than happy to get rid of my family's virus-ridden XP build with an AMD Sempron and who knows what for integrated graphics for... Wait, another pre-built? I've been meaning to build an XP computer since it's objectively the best version of Windows ever. My initial build was using an HP Pavilion A706N, actually two of them for their parts. I didn't choose this build, more so it chose me. I snagged these for the low cost of $3.99, hoping to turn this into a killer XP sleeper PC. But I didn't do my research and ended up wasting money on parts that I didn't know wouldn't fit. The GPU I bought was PCIe, and the board only had an AGP connector, so I ended up trading in my first dead desktop for an NVIDIA GeForce 256, as it's what would fit in this PC. It did work, but it ultimately dashed any hopes of running games like Crisis or Doom 3. I was never able to get XP installed on this machine because it didn't have the drivers to look for the SATA ports, meaning I couldn't use a spare hard drive from my first desktop. Also, the CD drive wouldn't boot from a CD, yet it would recognize the floppy drive. I went in blind and got lost, so I decided to go back to the drawing board and make use of yet another pre-built computer that I had just lying around. This is my Plan B XP build. It's a Lenovo H420 desktop from 2011. This was originally spec'd as a Windows 7 computer, which was updated to Windows 10 when I got it. It features an Intel Core i3-2100 and 6GB of RAM with a 1.4TB hard drive. When I picked up this computer, I didn't know what to do with it. Since it used a dual-core CPU, I wasn't going to use it for anything remotely close to modern gaming. I thought about turning it into a Minecraft server, but after being told about the higher energy bill at home in December of 2022, I shelved that idea permanently. I couldn't sell this to my local computer store because who wants cheap, underpowered desktops like this? Me, apparently, since it's what's featured in this video. I just left this thing sitting away for months, not knowing what to do with it. But when I tried and failed to build into the HP computer, I decided to give this Lenovo a shot. I did some research on what CPUs would be supported by XP, and a Tom's Hardware forum post from 2013 let me know that people had luck getting XP running on 3rd gen Intel CPUs. If people were having luck getting XP to run on Ivy Bridge, I'd certainly have luck running XP on Sandy Bridge. But if legacy support was on my short list of things I wanted in an XP build, I would have stopped trying to attempt this build. There are no legacy PCI slots on this board. Only small PCIe slots with one big PCIe slot for a GPU. Tired of me saying PCIe yet? SLI and Crossfire weren't going to happen on both this PC and the Pavilion, and that's okay, since SLI didn't grant that much of a performance boost for gaming anyway. The board also lacks headers for IDE, but by 2011, IDE was rendered obsolete by SATA, and I'd be saving IDE spinning rust for the Pavilion. Also, no, there was nothing important on the hard drive, it was pretty much a blank slate when I got it. If I wanted any legacy support for things like sound cards, or even PCIe for miscellaneous controller cards, I'll look into adapters in the future. But 
For now, I just want to see if it's possible to even get XP running on this machine. I didn't put much into this build since I had everything to get off the ground. In fact, I took more things out of this computer than what I put in. The Wi-Fi card was one of the first parts to go since connecting XP to the internet in 2023 is a bad idea. The other part I considered removing was the 2GB stick of RAM since the 32-bit XP doesn't use much more than 4GB of memory. I'll specify what I did put into the computer later since it's crucial to the story of the build, and I want you all to guess whether or not I actually got this PC to run XP. Make your bets! Did I actually get this to run on XP? Make your guess in the comments, and let me know if you were right or wrong. Before I kicked the project into motion, I made damn sure to do my research on this computer inside and out. I already knew legacy slots were non-existent on the board, so I looked into the drivers for this computer. The good news is that Lenovo still hosts drivers for this PC online, most of which had support for 32-bit XP. The first issue I tackled after my research was the SATA problem. XP didn't ship with SATA support, and that fact hasn't changed even with Service Pack 3. That's one of the things that made me give up on trying to use that spare drive I had for the pavilion. The motherboard of that has SATA ports, but none of the drivers use them since neither one of the computers had hard drives in them. Putting in this totally legit copy of XP into the CD drive confirmed that the drive worked, and that SATA was a no-go for this installation. LGR had this issue with its XP build. Finally, it's time to get Windows XP installed on our new healthy RAID array, which went absolutely swimmingly. Until it didn't. And he used a program called Enlight to make a custom disk image to install XP with. Try as I might to load the SATA drivers onto the custom disks I burned, I could not escape the BSODs. A bit of googling led me to switching a setting in the BIOS for ADA modes. It recommended that I switch from AHCI mode to IDE mode. Switching to that and inserting the installation disk actually made a difference. I could now move forward with installation! Victory! Now that installation could continue, I had to reformat the hard drive in this thing, which recognized the 1.4 plus terabytes of space available. Getting the hard drive formatted took almost four, four hours. hours. By one in the morning, the formatting was complete. It took a half an hour to finish installing the rest of XP, but it worked! I was in disbelief that I got XP installed on this thing! The next order of business was to load up the drivers. I put drivers onto yet another CD and started running into a few snags, most of which were related to not having the .NET framework installed. It made installing the drivers troublesome, especially the Intel HD graphics driver. That driver proved to be problematic, and I would deal with finishing the rest of the drivers the next day. Oh, and uh, activating this installation. The next day, I got to finishing up driver installation, making sure the .NET framework was installed to make driver installation more likely to succeed. Most of it worked, but I ran into a couple of issues saying, Uh, your computer doesn't meet the minimum requirements to install this, uh. So I did pluck the 2GB RAM stick, and it made at least one of the installers happy. The graphics driver was just bad, so I looked for an earlier version of the same driver. Thankfully that did the trick, and now I had an almost complete XP installation. The last order of business I wanted to touch up on, at least for getting the installation going, was activating the damn thing. XP required product activation as a way to circumvent illegal copying, but since XP is no longer supported, people found ways to beat it. I won't go into depths as to how I got this computer activated, but let's say it involves the phone method. Although I didn't use my phone, I'm told that method still works. Now that my installation was complete, it was time to figure out what to do next with this. I still had one goal in mind, running Doom 3. I might have been able to try Crisis if I didn't wait too long to try and get it from my local resale store, but I had to get Doom 3 as soon as I saw of this shelf's existence. A true time capsule of 2000s PC gaming. For the 2000s, Doom 3 was one of the major benchmarks of any gaming PC. That and Crisis, of course. It required a GPU with a hefty amount of VRAM just to get it to run at all, and even then the most advanced GPUs of the time couldn't run the game at ultra settings. Integrated graphics just won't cut it. Time to remedy that and make use of that PCIe slot. Speaking of PCIe, guess what this PC's power supply didn't have? A PCIe connection for video cards. 
That big M by side card I briefly had wouldn't work in this PC unless I swapped out the power supply for something more modern and with more wattage. I had to choose a card that didn't require more power. At first, I chose an XFX ATI Radeon HD 4650, which had one gigabyte of VRAM, two DVI ports, and an S video port. There was one problem. It didn't work. It didn't show up in the device manager, and driver installation failed no matter how hard I tried it. So I hastily returned to my local computer store and exchanged it for this, a PNY branded NVIDIA GeForce GT 730. It was a low profile GPU, but it also had one gigabyte of VRAM, so I gave it a shot. The good news is that it worked. It was detected right away in the device manager, but I needed to load up the drivers for it to get it running properly. That also worked, and now it was ready. But first, why not change up the desktop to match? Awesome. The way it's meant to be played. Before I get to testing any games on it, I had one more part I wanted to try. The Asus Supreme FX X-Fi. I initially thought it was a sound card, and I wasn't too far off. However, doing some quick research on this led me to discover that it was really meant only for ASUS and ASRock motherboards. But it has text that glows when inserted into the PCIe slot. How could this possibly fail? Well, it did. Device Manager didn't see it, and I couldn't install drivers for the device since the installer couldn't detect it. Yeah, it really only was meant for ASUS and ASRock motherboards, seeing as it's supposed to interface exclusively with parts of those boards. It also wasn't a true sound card, since it also interfaced with your generic HD audio drivers, and it ran the stuff from Creative, EAX, XFi stuff, in software. Oh well, not a serious problem, but an interesting footnote that I tried. With the computer complete, let's plug in some speakers and get to some games. I'll be using Fraps to display the game's frame rate in real time, starting off with a classic. 3D Pinball Space Cadet. Okay, it really doesn't push the computer to its limits, but I had to put it here since it's basically a requirement to play this game in any XP build video. The first game we'll try, for real, is Doom 3 from id Software. I was pleasantly surprised to find that this game runs flawlessly on ultra settings. Even when getting into the action, the frame rate remained constant. It's not unlocked, sadly, but it's holding a smooth 60 FPS almost all the time. I know you can't see it at that frame rate because of my phone's camera, but it was running at 60. <laughs> Next up is a game I haven't tried at all, Painkiller by People Can Fly. Based on the first level of gameplay, I'm already liking this game. It's a horde shooter in the vein of games like the original Doom, as well as Killing Floor and Ultra Kill. And on the highest settings, it's running like a champ. Frame rates are under the triple digits here with V-Sync turned off. I want to try this game out a bit more. I dig it. Oh, 
The last game I have is Sid Meier's Pirates, the 2008 reprint by Take-Two, developed by Fire Axis Games. Yar har fiddly dee, I don't think this game's for me. There's a lot of complex stuff in the game, and I don't have a manual on hand to figure out what I'm doing, but I'm sure fans of other Sid Meier games like Civilization would get a kick out of it. But perhaps it be the only swashbuckling game out in the Seven Seas. Oh, and performance is hobbled by the game itself, dropping down to 30 FPS in any gameplay. SHIVER ME TIMBERS! Test. So done. Done it, Brad's over. <laughs> And that's going to wrap up this impromptu Windows XP build. I really wished this thing had legacy PCI support so I could eventually find a sound card, ideally with EAX support. But at the end of the day, that's okay. It just feels nice to have an XP machine that's working, and I hope you enjoyed following me through the process. I finally get to reclaim all those years in gaming I missed out on as a kid with a crazy PC made from a pre-built. Seriously, this is one sick sleeper PC I put together. I can't wait to see where I go next with this machine. What are your thoughts on this build, or Windows XP in general? Drop a comment below, and also let me know if there was anything I could have done differently with this PC. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, this is Squiddy the Kid, signing off. Oh, and one more thing. That other HP I have for parts, it fell victim to the capacitor plague, having caps that were bulging and or blown. It will never boot up again. Okay, that's it. Video's over. Goodbye.